Con unos minutillos de retraso, pero aquí estamos otra vez. Eh, bienvenidas, bienvenidos. Ayer fue un día, por lo menos desde el punto de vista de los organizadores, muy interesante. Hubo ponencias que, que nos parecen muy importantes en el contexto. Os recuerdo que estamos en un país, España, donde el gobierno ha tolerado el cultivo de transgénicos a gran escala. El único país de la Unión Europea en el que se cultivan miles de hectáreas de transgénicos, se hablan de unas 100.000 en España, donde están la mitad de los campos experimentales de la Unión Europea y donde todas eh, las medidas de seguridad políticas, todo, los, eh, la, 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 todo lo que tenga que ver con transparencia, con implementación de normativa europea, etc., brilla por su absoluta ausencia. No hay, no hay ningún, eh, ninguna herramienta política o jurídica en el, en el Estado español al que podamos agarrarnos para defendernos de esta agresión. Entonces, en ese marco, eh, las organizaciones que voy a repetir, pero que veis aquí los logos, Amigos de la Tierra, Confederación de Consumidores y Usuarios, COAG, Ecologistas en Acción, Greenpeace y Plataforma Rural, decidimos convocar estas jornadas científicas eh, para, de alguna manera, que eh, muchas de las audiencias, no solo los que estáis aquí, sino a través de Internet, escuchen... De, de la voz de grandes, eh, grandes eh, expertas y expertos internacionales hablar de biotecnología desde diferentes puntos de vista. El primer ponente de hoy eh, se llama Michael Antonio. Michael eh, pertenece al grupo de expertos en genética y terapia eh, de la Escuela de Medicina del King's College de Londres. Eh, trabaja en el Departamento de eh, Genética Molecular y Médica y la ponencia que nos va a dar hoy es, es Perspectiva genética moderna de los transgénicos. Os dejo con Michael. So, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for Im inviting me to speak at this uh, very important meeting. I would like to congratulate them for having the foresight to hold this important event. And particularly, I'd like to thank uh, Juan Philippe Carrasco of Greenpeace for the invitation. And I'd also like to extend my own thanks to the sponsors, because without them, I probably would not be here. So, what I would like to discuss with you this morning is something which I feel is missing from the, those who are adv advocating GM crops, uh, what I feel both scientists and also regulators, something that they have consistently failed to do through, throughout the time, including right up to the present day, is to place to place the technology of GM crop production within the ever-advancing field of genetics, how we understand genes to be organized and regulated, because that is an ever-changing uh, situation. Just to give you why, why is this important. When you, when you develop technologies are based on the discovery of some functioning in nature. You make a discovery, uh, say, on how you can cut and join DNA, how do you introduce DNA into different organisms, and you, you can end up with genetically modified organisms. So a genetic, uh, so a, dis a technology is based upon the latest understanding discoveries in basic science. But the basic science is not a static situation. That is forever changing. And what is very important, of course, is to review. Review the technology you have, you have developed against the advancing basic science for two reasons. One is that you may be able to improve your technology and make it even better, but also to re-evaluate re its safety, because some of the assumptions that you made at the beginning, when you first developed the technology, may turn out not to be correct. 
And there may come a time when the basic science comes to a point which says, actually, we were very wrong with our assumptions at the beginning, and that this technology actually is far more risky and dangerous than we thought it was. And if that is the case, for me, we should have the courage to say, no, we have to stop now. Because yes, at the time when we started with all good intention, it looked safe, but now the science, advancing science tells us that that is not the case and really we should bring it to a stop because it's too dangerous. I feel this, is, this aspect of relating GM crop technology to the advancing basic genetic science has simply failed to be done. And I, I hope to show that to you today. And because if one does, if one does this, uh, places the GM crop technology into a basic science, say a modern genetics perspective, we will find it to be very lacking, flawed, both technically and conceptually, and that the correct scientific thing to do, both from an efficacy and a safety aspect, is really, you should say, no, we, we must stop it and do something else which does fit the modern paradigm and, and within, a, within a, in a safe context. As for myself, to give you a little bit more about my background, I run a research group. We, we, classically, I'm a molecular geneticist. I study human gene organization and human gene control. I use genetic engineering technology every day, virtually, in my laboratory to, to get understanding into how genes are organized and how they're regulated. And more recently, based on the discoveries we've made, I'm channeling the, uh, my efforts now into developing uh, safe as well as efficacious uh, gene medicines, gene-based medicines for inherited diseases. And the difference between what I do, people like myself do, and what goes on in agriculture when you apply gene, gene technologies is that we, we work what we, and what we call under contained use conditions. We the organisms, the genetically modified organisms that we work with are genetically mutated. They are incapable of reproducing and spreading. And also we work under the contained conditions where everything that is contaminated is, is decontaminated, destroyed, uh, so that it does not escape into the environment. Even with gene medicines, if we introduce a gene medicine into a patient suffering from a disease, the, the, gene, the gene medicine is by law, as well as by sens sensible need, is, is incapable of replicating and spreading, even within the person, let alone from person to person. These are the safety features we build in to the procedure because we know that genetically modified organisms carry an unpredictable an, uh, aspect to them which makes them potentially dangerous. So we have to build these safety aspects into it. Of course, contrast that with what goes on in agriculture. Completely the opposite. People are, are producing GMOs. And remember, it's not just crops, but it's bacteria, viruses, insects, as well as crops are being engineered for agricultural uses. And they're being released into the environment. All of these things are capable of re reproducing, replicating, and spreading in a totally uncontrolled way, which means that if a problem arises, we're stuck with it. It'll be very, very difficult to actually eliminate it. So for me, the responsible way of using genetic engineering technology is an amazingly powerful technology. And without it, we would know only a fraction of what we know now about gene organization and control. So it's an amazingly powerful and useful technology. And for me, the responsible use of it is under these contained conditions, contained laboratory and industrial conditions as well for very targeted clinical applications. And what I feel is irresponsible use is really what goes on in agriculture where the GMOs are being released into the environment in an uncontrolled way. So that tells you a bit about my background and where I stand and where I personally draw the line. And please come back on me on this uh, later on in the discussion if you wish. Now, having said that, let's go on.
And I have to warn you, I hope you all got a very good night's sleep, because what we're going to go through this morning is some very hardcore molecular biology, so I hope you're all wide awake. Um, uh, but I hope at the end of the presentation you'll feel strong, empowered to go forward with even more powerful weapons to, in your campaign. The, I start with a slide that highlights the promises of GM crops made by industry when they were launched back in the 1990s. They promised all kinds of things, of course, you know, like solving the food crisis, feeding the hungry, they will benefit the environment by reducing herbicides and insecticides, they will help farmers and produce more nutritious food. All of these promises. But the, what, what they also claimed was that they were inherently safe. Of course, questions of safety. And that actually, that GM in agriculture was a natural extension of traditional breeding methods, but more precise and safer. An incredible statement to make, really. And, they also, this, and this fundamental point clearly underlined the whole approach, that genes are isolated units of information that can function in a totally predictable manner even when moved between unrelated species using GM technology. So what that means is I can take a gene from uh, a fish and I can put it into a strawberry and that fish gene will work in exactly the same way in the strawberry as it does in the fish. This is the, the, the conceptual idea uh, behind GM technology at its inception back in the 1980s was that really genes are isolated units of information. Now, that was the understanding at the time, actually. The, we, didn't, we knew very little about gene organization and the intricate networks of control that they're subjected to as we know them now. And so to, to treat genes as isolated units of information back in the 1980s was not understandable. The key is that you know, things have moved on. So, but this is the basis. But also, and, and on this basis, the fact that it's really GM is nothing more than an, uh, uh, a different kind of natural breeding, um, and that uh, the genes are just isolated units of information, uh, on that basis, the, the industry and the regulators also came up with this idea that GM crops and foods are substantially equivalent to non-GM and are safe to eat and for the environment. And I'll come back to this in just a minute. But that, basically what that means is that apart from the single new gene you've introduced into the plant using GM, apart from this, everything else is exactly the same. And therefore, there's nothing to worry about. So on this point, substantial equivalence and in also this term used in America, generally recognized as safe. This is purely hypothetical. Again, they just sit around the table and they discuss and say, well, we think that this GM and this non-GM are substantially equivalent. And since the non-GM is recognized as safe, then the, the, then the GM is, because it's substantially equivalent, is also, we can also consider as generally recognized as safe. It's not a basis of experiment. It's pu purely hypothesis. And also the European, this is what we call basically the equivalent term in the European Union regulation for substantial equivalent is comparative assessment. There's really no difference between the two. It's a different name for the same thing. But what, what, does, what is it that happens to establish substantial equivalence or comparative assessment? You own, the only requirement is for general biochemical analysis. Assessment of known toxins and allergens only. Okay. And the analysis is very crude, very gross. Yeah. GM and non-GM parental plants are substantially equivalent if they contain similar amounts of biochemical components within limits of natural variation. This again, a very vague term. And if you can establish substantial equivalence through these very gross analytical procedures, uh, meeting these gross criteria, then, uh, you s then the regulators are very happy, you and there are no feeding trials formally required 
if substantial equivalence is found especially. You don't have to conduct any kind of toxicology feeding studies. What are the flaws in this whole procedure? I mean, this is, this is not science, yeah? This is just uh, um, hypothesis and per expediency. This substantial equivalence and comparative assessment really is a way to do as little as possible to in order to get a product approved. It's not science, it's more commercially driven politics. So the flaw is that it only looks at gross biochemical composition and only looks at known components. And the whole idea of GM is that it has an unpredictable component. So if you're only looking there of what you know, you're gonna miss what the GM procedure has unexpectedly produced. So it's completely, it completely misses the point of GM technology right from the beginning, misses it completely. The fact that it has an unpredictable component and can produce new toxins, new allergens. If, yeah. For example, to give you something that's common to us in a, a, a terrible experience in England, that you, I'm sure you've all heard of BSC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, which was something suffered by cows in England in the 1980s. A BSC cow, if we were to do this type of substantial equivalence analysis on a BSC cow, we would find it to be substantially equivalent to a non-BSC cow. But, does, but it, does it make the BSC cow safe to eat? No. But that's what it would be passed. It would be passed by these regulations as safe to eat. Even though now we have cases, as you know, in England, people who ate BSC infected meat uh, have come down with this new variant, Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease, is terrible condition. So this, uh, just to give you, and I just want to focus one further thing. This limits of natural variation, what exactly does that mean? This very vague term. Beware of the uh, Monsantoisms. What do I mean by this? Basically, Determining the effect of the GM transformation process, both in terms of composition of the GM, in terms of biochemical composition, and also in terms of animal toxicity feeding studies, what you need to do in, in order to achieve these objectives is to minimize the variables. Because there is going to be variation. So you need to control for the, vari for the variable. But what, does, what is the Monsanto's approach? And I say Monsanto specifically because in the, in the, in the mid-1990s, when it published its first compositional analytical papers on the Roundup Ready soybean, the GM Roundup Ready soybean, it, it uh, used some very strange uh, analytical criteria. Monsanto's approach was to compare the GM crop on the food which large number of varieties that are unrelated, un, a large varieties of unrelated to the GM variety, uh, that were also grown under different times and uh, locations. So, in other words, the Roundup Ready soybean, we compared to many, many different other varieties, unrelated varieties of soybean and that will be grown at different times of different years and in different locations. Yeah. Oops. Or, and in addition to what the European Union also now also uses, is to actually use data in the literature to what they call historical norms. Now what is the outcome of this? The outcome of this really is that it actually masks rather than highlights the effect of the GM process. When, when, you're trying, when you're trying to highlight the effect of the GM transformation process and you're trying to minimize the variables, what this, procedure, what this procedure does is actually increase your variables rather than reduce the variation. Indeed, the only scientifically valid comparators are the GM and the non-GM parent, what's known as the isogenic, grown at the same time and location. Because under those conditions, you've eliminated the variables. Genetic variation has been minimized, and also variation due to environmental inputs of where the seed was grown in different locations and different times. That has also been minimized. So now what that has, 
Any differences you then find between the GM and the non-GM must be due to the GM process because you've eliminated the variation from other factors. So anything that comes up, you can point the finger at the GM. This is proper science. I can guarantee you that an, a graduate student looking at this approach would find it laughable because it is so flawed in its, uh, in its approach. Because what is the effect? Because what happens is, of course, when you look at such huge numbers, you introduce such a big variation in the composition. You know, in one variety, for any given component, it's this much, on another, it's this much, and your GM fits somewhere in here, and you say, oh, my GM composition fits in this variation, and therefore, it's substantially equivalent. That's a joke, because you're comparing it to something that is unrelated to the GM. You can only derive the effect of the GM transformation process if you compare it to its equivalent non-GM that's been grown side by side at the same time and place. But this is how you get away, this is how you basically get away from masking, really covering up the disruptive effect of the GM transformation process. Okay. So this is, one, this is one Monsantoism to bear in mind. So when you go to the literature, now, the worrying thing is that when other scientists, advocates, producers of GM crops, and also the regulators that have adopted this Monsanto model in their analysis of, uh, of the GM crop, that is the worrying thing. For some reason, and don't ask me why, but the regulators have adopted this flawed model of analysis. So be careful when you go out and look at the literature and you see this kind of design, recognize it as flawed, and that look for the appropriate comparison, which is what I've shown here at the bottom, which is the GM and the non-GM equivalent grown at the same time and location. I find that independent academics who do comparative studies follow this rule. Industry and regulators follow this rule. If they were right, why are we seeing problems? There are many problems that have arisen if that you cannot account by the model of the industry that GM is a natural, is uh, just an extension of natural breeding and, and, but safer and more precise. Just quickly to go through some issues. Growth, right from the beginning, GM crops, uh, there were experiences with problems of growing GM crops right to this day, both with cotton, suffering uh, growth problems of, the, of their roots and their cotton balls. Uh, some, varieties commercialized GM, some varieties of commercialized GM cotton more, more, were more susceptible to attack by worms. Soya was found to be uh, not tolerant to heat, uh, high temperatures in uh, the American mid Midwest. Uh, the stems of, of GM soy were found to split, and that the GM soy was highly, had highly reduced uptake of mang manganese from the soil. Manganese is an essential metal nutrient for the soy, for the plant, and so with too little of this, the plant is weak. But more importantly, in terms of growth, one of the promises of GM crops is to increase yield, but actually GM process has not increased the yield potential of plants at all, and indeed the opposite has happened. Right from the beginning, farmers experienced that the GM soy particularly gave lower yields, and that's been the case for over a decade now, and that this gave rise to a new concept in the field of, uh, of GM crops known as yield drag. Yield drag is the reduced yield that is observed between the GM and the non-GM equivalent. And, uh, and it's clear from controlled field studies that... Uh, a large part, at least 50% in this one trial that was conducted in the American Midwest by scientists at the University of Nebraska, that at least half of the yield loss was due to the GM transformation, disruptive effect of the GM transformation process. And these yield losses have also been observed with other GM varieties such as maize. Attempts by the industry to... Um, Attempts by the industry to make up this yield drag uh, 
by Monsanto a year or two ago introduced a new version of Roundup, of Roundup Ready Soya, which they called Roundup Ready Soya 2, RR2 Soya. But if you look at the data of its performance as well, and farmers, farmers reports in America of growing this new version of Roundup Ready Soya, the yield loss has not been fully made up at all, and that there is still a yield loss, because the GM transformation process has still had a disruptive effect. And the, and the, the most authoritative report I feel about, which has a comprehensive report that has looked at yields, um, has, uh, has, is this report from the Union of Concerned Scientists in the United States, failure to yield. What they, their conclusion from looking at the performance of GM crops in the United States over the, uh, the, the years since uh, 1996 when they were first introduced, they, they came to two conclusions. That firstly, yield increases in staple crops over this period of time were due to natural crossbreeding and not due to GM. But most worryingly were that that uh, the adoption of expensive G GE, or genetic engineering-based approaches to agriculture, has been at the cost of cheaper alternatives that carry less environmental risk. Of all the, the claims of, uh, of GM crops, I'm going to focus on this component here, really, the, to give you, to really shoot, uh, to show that this is simply... Uh, a flawed idea that G, G, GM crops and foods are substantially equivalent, are substantially equivalent to non-GM and are safe to eat and for the environment. If that was the case, yeah, if this was the case, then I would say, why are we seeing this? Controlled animal feeding studies show clear signs of toxicity linked to GM crops. I know Professor Seralini following me is going to cover this in greater details, but so I'm very quickly going to run through some studies that are showing clear evidence of linking the GM food with Ill, negative, Ill, negative, effects, negative ill effects to multiple organ systems in the animals in these controlled studies. And now, firstly, there are some studies conducted by independent academics have shown, for example, uh, so the con what I'm showing here is that extensive laboratory animal feeding studies with commercialized GM food raise worrying health concerns. Liver, pancreas, and testis function was disturbed in mice-fed GM soya. Mice-fed GM soya over the entire lifetime, 24 months, show more acute signs of aging in their liver. This is work from Manuela Malatesta, a scientist in Italy. Old and young mice fed GM insecticide-producing maize showed a marked perturbation in immune system cell populations and plasma uh, immune system chemical profiles. These cytokines are, are substances released, are control substances released by immune system cells. And the focus of this study was on old and young mice because they were supposed to represent the vulnerable members of our population. The young and the old are the most vulnerable and more likely to show signs of toxicity. Uh, from consumption of GM foods, if there was any. So that's why they modeled on young and old mice. Uh, additionally, rats fed GM insecticide-producing maize over three generations had a high incidence of necrotic areas, dead areas in liver and kidneys, and there was an alteration in their blood biochemistry. The, the feeding of GM insecticide-producing maize to mice over four generations, this was a uh, Austrian government-sponsored study, very extensive study, showed the build-up of abnormal structural changes in various organs, liver, spleen, and pancreas, and there were major changes in the pattern of gene function in the gut. Disturbances in the biochemistry in this organ, for example, as highlighted by cholesterol production, disturbance in cholesterol production, and protein production and breakdown. And there was a significant reduced fertility in this study. So over the four generations, there was clearly the, the group that was fed the GM maize was showing uh, a, la a reduced fertility by the mothers giving s smaller and smaller lit uh, numbers of uh, live births. And some other, this was uh, one of the very first studies conducted to show an effect from GM 
This is a non-commercialized variety of GM potato. The gut is a common target of adverse effects of, GMs, of GM foods. And in this study conducted by Arpad Putstai in, uh, in Scotland, what they found basically was that the animals fed the GM potato, the lining of their gut expanded enormously. This is the non-GM and this is the GM. And these, this kind of expansion in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the lining of the intestine, the gut, could be the first signs towards cancer. In another study conducted by scientists in Australia, they engineered a bean, a bean protein, bean alpha amylase inhibitor, into peas. And as this gave, um, so unlike in the, the, the same protein in the beans, worked normally, you know, you could eat it. Uh, there was no immune reaction to it. When this, when this gene was moved into peas and was fed to mice, they gave rise to uh, immune responses and allergic type reactions in the animals. And there is, uh, is there any link with human? Well, there have been anecdotal reports, not very well followed up, unfortunately, in terms of allergic reactions to Starlink GNMAs in the United States, and very well documented field reports of allergic reactions to BT cotton in India. Uh, I'll skip that. Industry studies, um, I'm sure Gilles Zarek will go into this in greater detail, but what Gilles Zarek has done very nicely is to reevaluate industry studies. Particularly, he began with this MON863, GM MON863. Again, these were from reports released after court actions for independent reevaluation. And when you look deep into this study, you can find the right comparison. Again, in this study, it was the typical Monsanto study, where the GM was compared to a very wide range of non-unrelated GM varieties. But in there was the correct comparison. If you dig deep into the data, you found, uh, yes, the GM and the non-GM equivalent data was there. So when you pull out that information, what you basically find is that the, um, there are marked disturbances to the blood system uh, in, these, in these animals in these different types of blood cells were decreased or increased, and the kidney weights were disturbed as well. Gilles Zarek's, Seralini's conclusion from this was that the rats fed insecticide-producing GMAs grew more slowly. They suffered problems with liver, kidney function, and showed high levels of certain fats in their blood as well. And in this uh, comparison of three GM corn varieties, uh, the conclusion was that... Uh, what came from these comparisons, from this one, and also this study as well, where most recently, was that the, the organs that seem to be more immediately affected, that show signs of toxicity, are the livers and the kidneys, which are the two primary organs of detoxification in the body. So there would be, in a, as you could say, there would be the focus of any effects of toxicity. Are these animal studies significant for us? Really? I've hardly got into it. Uh, the significance of these studies are, they're highly significant because these rats studies are, they're surrogates for human toxicological investigations. I mean, when, when you try a, a new pharmaceutical, they will first be tested in rats because they are the accepted surrogates of human health. So they're very significant. They have to take these studies very seriously. If these GM foods are showing toxic effects in the rats, then they have to be taken seriously. You can't just say, oh, a rat is a rat and a human is a human. If you take that point, it invalidates all the pharmaceutical toxicology studies that have ever been, ever been conducted. And that clearly nobody's going to do that. But it's extraordinary. They ignore... They, they don't ignore the pharmaceutical effects, but they choose to ignore the, the, G, the effects of G, feeding GM foods. And the other Monsantoism that you need to be aware of as well is that even when the industry acknowledges the fact that there's been a statistically significant difference between the GM and the non-GM in its effect 
is that they will say, oh, it's we accept that there's statistically significant difference, but it's not biologically significant. Now, this is, I'm sorry, this is making up. This is making things up. They're, this kind of thing is trying to rewrite science for your own commercial convenience, I would say. No scientist would, if something is statistically significant different, it is a statistically significant difference. And that means it is automatically biologically significant. You cannot argue any other way, but that's the industry position. So these arguments that, the cent that GM, if you, if you believe these positions, that actually GM is just another form of natural breeding and that genes are just isolated units of information that can be moved around in a very predictable way, you cannot explain what we have just discussed in terms of, say, crop bad crop performance and negative signs of toxicity in these animal feeding studies. So there are three, three sources of possible toxic effects from GM foods. The GM gene product itself, which in the case of BT toxin could be one possible source of toxicity. Ch changes in farming practice, the use of broad spectrum herbicides such as Roundup, and you're going to hear a lot about this from Gilles Eric Seralini. In my remaining time, I will focus on this aspect here, which is the adverse mutagenic effects of the GM transformation process, which are the novel toxins, allergens, and disturbed nutritional value. What the new genetics tells us, unlike the old genetics upon, wh upon which GM crop production was originally founded, was that actually gene order and organization in DNA is very precise, and that in most cases, more than one RNA or protein is produced from a given gene, and that many proteins perform more than one function. Genes exist in groups or families, so they're not and that genes work in groups. No gene works in isolation. You cannot treat a gene in isolation. Gene function is tightly regulated in a highly coordinated manner, both by local and distant genetic elements and layers of epigenetic control. I'll try and explain to you what this means in a short while. Genes have co-evolved to function together in an integrated whole within an organism. So these days, actually, this is an extraordinary thing that's been is that genes are now defined more by the context in within which they exist rather than purely their information content. The context in which they exist in relation to other genes and within a given organism. And uh, uh, so the point at the bottom here is that through, when you conduct normal sexual production or breeding, between, this can only take place between closely related organisms and that genes are inherited in their natural groupings that have been finely tuned to work harmoniously together by millions of years of evolution. So this is the difference between when you conduct normal breeding, you preserve natural genetic order and function. As Craig Venter, one of the, who led the company that uh, has said, who sequenced the human genome, the DNA, sequenced the DNA of, the, of humans. In everyday language, the talk is about a gene for this and a gene for that. We're now finding that is rarely so. The number of genes that work in that way can almost be counted on your fingers because we are just not hardwired in that way. If we're not hardwired in that way, then why do you expect when you introduce a GM gene into the plant, you, you can expect it to behave in a predictable way? The point is, it never does. This is just to remind you of the GM transformation process. And the message I want you to remind you from here, because you heard extensively about this from, from Christian Velo yesterday, is that there are two parts to the GM transformation process. Firstly, what we call the tissue culture. You grow the plant material on the dish in the laboratory. And then using a one procedure or other, either a we call a gene gun biolistic approach or bacterial infection using agrobacteria means you introduce your GM gene into the plant cells. Uh, but this is a very inefficient process. So in order to identify those cells that have, those plant cells that have, identi that have taken up successfully your GM gene, you, you use an, an antibiotic, the uh, link to your GM gene. 
So you give the cells, you apply the antibiotic to the cells. All the cells that have not taken up your GM gene die, and only the few cells that have taken up your GM gene and your antibiotic GM gene will now grow. And then from that, you can grow a whole plant. Okay. Two parts, tissue culture and the insertion of the gene. These are the two parts of the GM transformation process. How does this fit into the modern genetics? GM, DNA, and chromatin. DNA in, this, DNA in the nucleus of a cell, this is an electron microscope image of a cell nucleus, is not a naked molecule. It's associated with proteins. And these proteins, wrap, uh, the DNA is wrapped around these proteins to varying degrees of compaction, as illustrated here. Why is this important? Well, depending on the compaction of this DNA protein complex, which we call chromatin, if a gene finds itself in a compacted region of this chromatin, the genes are inactive. If the gene is present in this open, extended structure of chromatin, then the genes are active. So how does the GM process fit in this? If the GM gene inserts itself into this compacted, inactive region of the chromatin, then the GM gene and the antibiotic resistance marker gene will not express. They will be silent, and so the plant cells die. Only insertions into open, active regions of the chromatin will the, will the antibi antibiotic resistance marker gene, the ARM gene, express, and the plant cell survives, at least in some cases. What does that mean? If you go through, therefore, if we go through this procedure, this selection procedure of applying the antibiotic resistance antibiotic here, what, what, that, what that means is that you're selecting for the insertions of your GM gene, you're in, selecting for the insertions of your GM gene into these active regions of the, of the plant DNA. But what are the active regions of the plant DNA? They're regions where the host genes are working. So you're inserting randomly and selecting at the end of the day for an insertion of your foreign GM gene into an active region of the host DNA. So what this does is it maximizes the chances for disruption of the plant host genes. This is the conclusion. The whole GM transformation process at the end of the day selects for a splicing event of the GM gene in such a way that it maximizes the chances of inserting, of disrupting the host genes with negative, obviously, perturbations, disturbances on the host gene function with negative downstream consequences. Well, there's no way I'm finishing in three minutes. Uh, I don't know. Another 15, maybe. So this, I'll, I'll okay, you stop me when you, I'll try and go through. Yeah. So this process, this process of insertion of the gene, which causes disruption, is known as an insertion mutagenesis. And the, as I say, the foreign, and there are various ways in which this insertion mutagenesis can occur. Insurging directly into a gene to disrupt it, or just its presence, the presence of the, of the foreign gene, the GM gene, into a cluster of host genes will also, will also be disruptive on the functions of one or more genes in this area. In addition to this insertion mutagenesis, the tissue culture phase of the GM transformation process as well, through mechanisms that we still do not know, introduces large numbers of mutations throughout the DNA of the host plant. Hundreds or thousands of mutations throughout the host plant, many of which will survive, not all, but many of which will survive the breeding program that then produces the commercial variety of the crop. So as a result, 
The GM transformation process can markedly disturb protein type composition and poor core biochemical pathways. And I've just got here a series of slides on this commercial, you know, the only commercialized variety of GM maize that's grown here in Europe and here in Spain. And that the fine biochemical analysis of this crop variety that has now taken place in more recent years has shown that there are metabolic disturbances in, in, in this uh, variety of GM maize, in the amino acid composition, and also in its protein profile. This excellent study from Italy shows that the protein profile of these, uh, of the monate 10 maize is highly disturbed. Some proteins are expressed more highly, some have gone down, and uh, one protein appears which normally is not there at all. And storage proteins are also truncated. These kinds of effects, for me, are signs that the GM transformation process has had major damaging effect to the DNA of the, of the maze. And these are another couple of examples of disturbances in the, the biochemistry of rice, of GM rice, these studies from China. This is the control. You can just look at the effect of the GM transformation process on just the appearance of the control and the transgenic GM variety. But the, the, but the more worrying thing is, is the disturbance in the biochemistry composition. The nutritional composition of this rice has been markedly disturbed, as in this study as well. I don't have time to go into uh, the, um, the golden rice. But what these studies for me highlight is the need to conduct these molecular profiling analyses. What we call our omics analytical methods. Genomics, which is total GNA sequence analysis. Transcriptomics, which is total gene function profile. Proteomics, which is total protein profile. And metabolomics, which is total small molecule profile. These, these are cutting edge. These are state of the art cutting edge methods which really the whole of science is turning to for its analytical methods and insight. So the question that arises is, why are regulatory bodies actively opposing introducing these, these processes? The simple answer is that if they used, if these methods were used, no GM crop will be found to be substantially equivalent. And therefore, you would require more work to get approval. Could you do a yes, I will. Yes, I will. So, genetic modification is a new technology. No, I will go to this then. GM implants, there's no resemblance to natural sexual production and bypasses natural species barriers. It brings novel combinations of genes that have not evolved to function together. The GM transformation process, transgene insertion plus tissue culture is highly mutagenic. And GM to a lesser or greater degree will always disrupt host gene order and function. These combined effects of GM disrupt genetic and protein biochemical function, leading to the generation of novel toxic effects, allergies, and altered nutritional value. Uh, can disrupt. Okay. And so in summary, the new genetics tells us that GM in crop production is conceptually and technically flawed, and is really yesterday's technology based on yesterday's understanding of genes and genetics. GM possesses inherent unpredictability for health and environment, which is currently impossible to quantify. And uh, for me, the release of viable GMOs into the environment is not justified and possibly irresponsible, as once released into the environment, GMOs cannot be recalled. Thank you very much. Thank you.